200 miles inside the Arctic Circle. A Chinook crew from RAF Odium's 27 Squadron trained for landing in the snow. Northern Norway is a tough place to learn anything. For us as air crew, while we're flying, again, a bit different. As you can see from the background, it's all white, white, white. And then we've got a bit of cloud out, out in the sky. Uh, unlike today where it's beautiful, but when you've got a bit of cloud, uh, you've got white cloud on a white hill, and it's hard sometimes to see where the hill stops and the sky begins. So for us, very disorientating, very, very disorientating flying in those conditions. You don't know which way is up and down, so you, you have to learn slightly new techniques for dealing with it. Yeovil's Commando Helicopter Force is running the exercise. There's three RAF Chinooks here for the first time since the Afghanistan war. For the air crew, it's not dissimilar to landing in the desert. They still get that goldfish bowl effect, except instead of dust, it's snow. It really can distort their vision. They can't see where they're taking off or landing from. What you do find difficult is with the snow, uh, finding references on the ground. So uh, in the desert, you'll get a dust cloud coming through, uh, but you'll be able to land um, using the references on the ground. In the snow, what we're finding uh, after a few years away is, is that it's quite difficult to pick a point on the ground. So having those references on the ground is, is probably the hardest part. We do two different profiles. We do the first where we uh, come to a hover, a high hover, and let that snow blow out. And hopefully, slowly, uh, we'll be able to descend and that snow will wash off, allowing us to land. If there's too much snow or we have um, an operational motive to get down on the ground a little bit faster, and we do the second technique in which we come in for a zero speed landing, uh, continuing down and forward as we go. Um, that's probably the harder of the two techniques and uh, causes the most issues uh, for us as a pilot. It's minus 15 degrees at ground level, even colder in the bowls around the area. And landing in the snow has its own hazards, hence the skis. Each ski weighs about 100 kilos, a couple of meters long, fit one of them on each, uh, each wheel point and they'll just spread the weight of the aircraft over the snow so that when we land on, instead of falling into the snow and ripping a wheel off, we land on safely and remain at the top of the snow. Uh, they make it look ridiculous, good, good fun flying around with them. The Chinooks are here with the Commando Helicopter Force, both part of Joint Helicopter Command, a tri-service helicopter force ready for contingency operations. After this Arctic training, 27 Squadron will be on five days readiness. It's for any contingencies. Uh, 18 Squadron and 27 Squadron essentially go uh, year on uh, and year off with, uh, with their readiness states. Uh, so we've always got an aircraft on national standby which is um, on a notice to move uh, for um, civilian military cooperation in the UK. Uh, and we're on the five days notice to move for worldwide contingency. The Arctic doesn't discriminate. Age, sex or even rank. Those not equipped with the knowledge to survive in the extreme environment will last little longer than a day. Anywhere else in the world, whether it's jungle or desert, you can sit on your Bergen for 24 hours and very little will happen to you. Out here, and the temperature today is minus 25, if you sat on your Bergen for 20 minutes, you would, be, you would have problems. So you really have to understand the environment and know how to survive. That's why every man and woman on exercise clockwork must go through the cold weather survival course. So, from now on then, when I say you're stuck in avalanche, put your hands down all together, yeah? Four, three, two, one. Done. The Arctic is very much the playground of the Royal Marines mountain leaders. Okay, second shot, please. They're running the four-day courses and have taught a number of naval engineers to become survival instructors. We send people like me to help the mountain leaders and keep an eye on when they're in the ten-man tents through their cooking, their lamp skills and the basic kind of knowledge from that or what I've learned through being a tent commander and pass that on to my oppos back when they come out to do their tent, uh, cold weather survival course. What do people normally struggle with the most when they come on this course? Uh, just making themselves warm and being aware of when they're struggling with that. Um, but generally, the equipment we have is great, and then through that, just knowing how to w work it from there and understanding it all, and just little tips and tricks that come through that. 
Today, it's lessons in the art of camouflage and concealment. Okay, light discipline, red filters potentially, or if you haven't got a red filter, using your hands and your map to cover the, uh, the white filter on your torch, that kind of thing. It's a try service effort from the students. Moving about in the snow is tiring. Um, even, you know, simple things like making a drink or getting your food just takes so much longer. Um, but uh, but it's all, all achievable and, and you just find that you can push yourself a lot further than perhaps you thought. And for the first time, soldiers from the Princess of Wales Royal Regiment have joined clockwork. Through our links with the Royal Marines, we're out here partnering with them, going through their training in Arctic warfare, um, which is really good because it's developing our skills as infantiers um, to be able to adapt to different environments. Obviously for us, we're usually in field where it's raining um, and it's usually about nought degrees upwards as opposed to minuses. So for us, it's really good to develop our skills in different environments. The course teaches the basics of survival in the extreme conditions. It's very much a soldiering effort. For some of the personnel here on the cold weather survival course in northern Norway, the temperatures and conditions may come as quite a shock. Some of them have only done their two days in the field as part of their basic training, and now they're here in Norway facing temperatures peaking at minus 25. All, all this environment in general is a shock to anyone who's done uh, time in the field in the UK. It's a totally different environment, but luckily we have the, the uh, Royal Marine MLs to keep everyone on track and, and well educated from there. Some people move um, one behind each other, each following the same footsteps. You can't really put it in, into words. When I go back in there, like, what was it like? Obviously cold is the first answer we'll say, but it's it's more than that. It's The scenery for me has made it worth it. Um, it's just, you wake up in the morning, I've never seen mountains like that, I've never seen the sunrise like that. Um, so for me, it's, it's amazing. Um, the kind of challenges that come with it, obviously, is keeping warm. Um, when I take back, obviously, extra layers, layering techniques, start cold, heat yourself up, um, those sort of things will be good. Um, so far, no frostbite, so that's a bonus. Everyone from engineers to pilots must complete the course. If an aircraft was to come down in the mountains, it's their only chance of beating the conditions and making it out alive. This is a winter survival course, so potentially if they were to go out anywhere in their vehicles to break down from their aircraft to break down, they all need to be able to survive and operate in this environment. So this course helps them understand the severity of what is out there and from there helps them operate correctly if needs be. It's Merlin Mark III helicopters like these that could well be responsible for getting the Royal Marines into battle. Whether that's in the desert, the jungle, or here, deep in the Arctic. That's why, for almost 50 years, the Commando Helicopter Force has brought its air crews and support staff to Norway. Well, it offers a real challenging environment uh, that both the air crew can uh, learn to fly in these extreme conditions because the weather can change very quickly um, and taking off landing in the snowy conditions it can be a real challenge for uh, air crew. It's not only the, the cold weather that's a factor so with that it brings uh, lots of aircraft limitations so the air, aircraft performance is going to be different you've got um, limitations for the weather that it's going to impose on you so um, actual routing of the aircraft and also landing taking off for example the snow is going to affect um, references that the pilot has so he's going to have, um, when he comes into a snow landing, for example, he's going to have fewer vi visual references than he would have in the UK. So um, it's, it's the entire process through from, from operating, planning, uh, and also flying the aircraft. Um, it's, it's good practice for us. The 30-ton Merlins are on a navigation sortie, just one of the many aspects of the flying training of exercise clockwork. The Merlins belong to 845 Naval Air Squadron, part of the Commando Helicopter Force under Joint Helicopter Command. Out here, their engineers are working even longer hours, simply due to the cold. The cold does affect them. Obviously, everything takes so much, much longer than what they would do back in the UK. A lot of the kit needs to warm up, so we have to take things out, like the aircraft batteries and stuff like that have to come out before um, they go outside and then we have to put them back in, so stuff like that just takes that little bit longer before the aircrew can actually take the aircraft when they need it. Trooping is another task that takes considerably longer. We carry 16 troops with four Bergens, skis, ski poles and their polks. So whereas in the UK or a more warmer climate, it will take three to five minutes to load them on. Out here you're looking 10 to 15 minutes to load all the kit in. 
It's currently about minus eight at the moment, and it has reached temperatures of around minus 25, so it's actually positively quite warm at the minute. I've come up to Bardafoss, where there's some members of the Royal Air Force, the Army and the Royal Navy here on their cold weather survival course, and they're spending the night out in a tent. I've come to meet them to find out a little bit about what it's been like. Uh, Ollie. Ollie. Um, Sean. Sure. Sure. How are you finding it? Yeah, good. Yeah. Really good. Is it um, what you expected? Yeah, I think so. Um, had a chat with some of the guys that've been on before, yeah. and they sort of gave us a bit of an insight into it. Um, but the weather's been pretty good to us. You know, yeah, it's cold, but it's not raining. It's not blowing a hoolie, so actually, it's yeah, pretty good conditions. Pretty good. Cool. And what have you guys been doing today? Uh, we started off with a kit check this morning, and then with uh, an insertion about a k and a half up to this location. And how does this compare to anything you've done before? Um, the environment makes it a bit different, but um, being infantry, we carry kit anyway, so it's not really that, doesn't bother us that much. And Ollie, well, well, yeah, is this what you expected? Is it harder, is it a bit easier? Or? No, no, I think it's pretty, pretty standard. I hear a lot of stories, a lot of guys come through. So I've been in a while, I've just never made it to the Arctic for whatever reason, but a lot of guys have, so you hear a lot of stories of these courses, they're all fairly similar. Um, I think, I don't think they've got any easier necessarily, so I think we had it as they had it, and um, yeah, pretty much what I expected. Um, but I would say it's probably better, slightly easier, if I'm honest, than I was expecting, um, just because it's, you know, it's nice and warm in here, it's pretty good. Yeah. And are you guys hoping to get a bit of sleep tonight, or is that not on the cards? Uh, there's some more lessons later on, light and noise demonstrations, um, and then I'll be into routine, and um, which means sleep, so, yeah. And I guess you're both looking forward to getting out of here and getting back to your day jobs. Um, no, actually, uh, <laughs> I, I actually, I actually quite like it. So, um, yeah, it's cold, but, you know, I don't mind it. Yeah. And for yourself? Yeah, no, I'm looking forward to getting out. Um, I'm here to fly in Norway, so, and I haven't done that before, so... I'm enjoying this, don't get me wrong, but get it out of the way and then hopefully get out and, and see some see some more in Norway. It should be good. Oh, well, I hope you guys get a good night's sleep and thank you for letting me come and see you. No problem, thank you very much. Flying through the Nordic mountains, the afternoon sun makes this scene as pretty as a picture. But the snow and the mountains are misleading. For the pilots flying here, the training is quite unlike anything else. There's dangers around every ridge. It's difficult to judge scale and distance, making this training particularly unique to these Nordic mountains. The environment we find in Norway is that when you've got uh, different ridge lines, you've got uh, the sky in the background, especially when it's uh, snowing, uh, it's all the same colour. Um, we've had incidents in the past where people have mistaken a, a ridge line for, for the ground, um, so the horizon uh, is different. So you get false horizons, so you find yourself flying towards the ground instead of what should be the horizon. Uh, and in that you get hidden masts, uh, hidden wires. Uh, so we, we have to do a lot of planning uh, before we go flying, which makes sure we're not gonna hit those masts. The Chinooks are from 27 Squadron, based at RAF Odium. It's the first time the squadron has deployed to Norway. And for some pilots, it's their first time flying in such harsh conditions. Okay, so today was my introduction to mountain flying techniques uh, out in the Arctic environment. Uh, so we started off by going around um, just flying and navigating as you would in the UK but just spotting the differences um, in this environment being the snow and the dangers of operating in the cold weather and the mountains being um, steep, not really being able to see what's coming next. Navigating through the region's mountains is a feat itself. It then progressed to the sortie, uh, heading in towards landing on some mountainous features uh, including pinnacles, bowls, and um, then a bit of a valley feature as well. They're based out of Bardafoss Air Station, 200 miles inside the Arctic Circle for exercise clockwork, run by the Commando Helicopter Force. We're here to support our uh, Norwegian NATO allies, uh, but also we're here to train ideally with the Lee Commando Group, uh, three command brigades, so we can support them in their contingency operations anywhere in the world. The emphasis isn't just about mountain flying. Chinook, as you're aware, is a heavy cargo aircraft, so our job is to move people 
and uh, cargo around. Quite often we do that underneath the aircraft via the underslung loads that you'll see us flying around with. Again, a bit different out here because you're hovering uh, above the load and you haven't got much in the way of references around you to uh, keep yourself steady. So uh, again, practicing that a little bit different from what it is normally back home, a little bit harder. Less clues, less visual clues to clue you in, uh, less for you to see. However, with the Mayot we're working out here, the Mo Mobile Air Ops team, uh, they set up the landing sites for us and they put markers out so we can use them to know where we are. With support from the Mobile Air Operations team and the Joint Helicopter Support Squadron, there's time to work on some load lifting. The, the aircraft fly circles around. Uh, we have a radio communication from ground to aircoms. Um, and then basically we just wait for the aircraft to come in. We make sure either team is on the ground uh, stationary with the load itself or we're jumping in and out of the BV, keeping, trying to keep warm. The downwash is so powerful. Nasty clumps of ice come flying fast and hard from all directions. And the soft snow now has a sting as it hits the skin. The uh, downdraft is second to none out there and it uh, sort of blows all the snow and ice uh, around and you do end up catching it up if you're not uh, properly covered up. Driving on the North Norwegian roads in winter is treacherous, as this military Land Rover proves. It's minus 22 and the roads are covered in thick ice. And that's why drivers here with the Commando Helicopter Force in Norway are learning to drive on this specially created skid pan. Gives them the techniques they'll need to drive safely on the roads in the snow and ice. All Norwegian nationals who drive must learn the skills for controlling a car on the ice. It's no different for the drivers of the Commando Helicopter Force. A common thing that people do tend to do uh, in an accident or if, if something's um, run out in front of them is to slam on the brakes. It's just natural to do that where the wheels lock up. What we teach them to do is to come away from that, if you like, so you're coming off the brake and they get the steering control back of the, um, the vehicle. So where locking up the brakes, you just keep on skidding until you either stop or hit the object. What we teach is a technique that will allow you to bring some sort of steering back into that as well. Learning to drive out here is uh, something completely different. Um, never, never driven on ice before, so obviously learning how to skid, the different types of skid, so front wheel and rear wheel, uh, it's really good practice and obviously helps you on the roads when you're driving around. The winter temperatures can fluctuate from plus 5 to minus 30, making the driving conditions even more hazardous. Stopping distances can be four times what they would be in the UK. Generally the, the road conditions are always permanently icy. Uh, then when you couple that with um, you know, the snowstorms and blizzards that you can get, it can get pretty nasty out here. Uh, it differs a lot because obviously back in the UK it's very rare that you get this, this much sort of ice in that. So um, yeah, it's very good, very good use uh, for the actual vehicle itself and getting used to sideways, sideways motion on a Land Rover. The steering becomes a lot lighter. Um, the possibility of a skidding is that much higher. The braking distances are about four to ten times more than what they'd be back in the UK. So you can imagine if you, you get into that situation out on the road, so you're going to be in a, a hell of a lot of trouble. This Land Rover brakes at the cones. Each time it's travelling at a different speed. 50 kilometres an hour. 60 kilometres an hour. And 80 kilometres an hour. It takes a good 70 metres for it to stop. Taking corners can be equally as dangerous. The main time you generally seem to get a skid is when you're on a corner. All right, it's normally going too fast um, or your steering's too harsh. So we take them around um, a little um, circuit all right, which demonstrates what happens when you do do that. And then we teach um, various techniques um, to counteract the skid. Only a handful of military personnel are qualified for driving in the conditions the Arctic presents. Without them, the exercise would quickly grind to a halt. Exercise clockwork is now in its 47th year. Last year, the UK government made a considerable investment in the facility, cementing a future for British forces in the Arctic. The uh, 
base is based the living side has been rebuilt completely uh, quite a challenge because the, uh, the demolition started on the 6th of June uh, 2016 and we took over all this new accommodation by the 21st of October which was quite a feat. With military activity in the Arctic increasing and tensions rising between Russia and NATO exercises like this in Norway are likely to prove just as valuable as ever.